Welcome to Ava, and uh, thank you for coming. So a little bit about um, Kelly Hersey. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the Linda Rush Visual Arts Gallery exhibiting artist Kelly Hersey. <laughs> Kelly Hersey spent many years creating uh, marketing graphics, designing original typography, and designing educational books. She taught numerous visual art and design courses, including digital and traditional photography, typography, and the history of design. She taught at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, the University of Massachusetts Lowell, Boston University, and Northern Vermont University at Linden. She holds a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Michigan and a Master of Fine Arts from Boston University. As an artist, Kelly understands the importance of supporting artists. We are so fortunate that she serves on Ava's board of directors. Kelly lives in Norwich, Vermont and shares a working art and design studio with her husband and son. Please welcome the artist, Kelly Hersey. Thank you. Uh, with the help of Sam and Travis, I put together um, a short video showing how I make images and what I do with them once I, how I select them and then what I do with them once I uh, get the images out of the camera and put them into Photoshop. Is that loud enough? Better? Okay. Um, when the exhibit was first hung, I, I have to give credit to um, Dave, our development director's daughter, who was sitting um, in the volunteer's chair that day, and she said, oh, are those your paintings? Thank you, no, those are my photographs. But that reaction was exactly what I get myself when I make the photographs, when I'm finished with the photographs, and what I hope uh, comes across to other people and that is that the photography itself lends a tiny taste of reality, but what I do with it, I hope, is much more akin to painting, even though it comes out of the computer itself. It doesn't come directly from my hand, it comes from my eye. Um, so without further ado, I'll take you through what I do to make the images, if I can properly get this to, there we go. First thing I do is I scan the general area that I've chosen to make an image. So I'm starting with this spot I've used to photograph in the past. Unfortunately, a big tree has fallen down over the waterfall area, so I'm going to move on to another one. This is the second location I uh, would like to check out. It's a smaller waterfall with potentially similar access, but it doesn't have enough this year a change in, very, in, in grade from one stone to another, so the waterfall area is too short to support or visually make interesting a composition with uh, shards of glass, so I'll move on from this one as well. This location is uh, at a rubble rock wall that's um, not too far from the edge of our property and has turned out some wonderful images with the snow and stone in the past, not this particular place, but I don't see much potential today as I move through the, um, the particular front area of this with the stream. I can see that in the future there may be an, um, an ability to contrast the two banks with the shadow and their shadows from surrounding uh, foliage, but not today. Uh, it's, that's not enough uh, visual interest for we'll move on. This is normally a um, potentially wonderful area with very shallow waters in the springtime and we even get some um, some a significant amount of green foliage right now and with the shadows of the trees and surrounding foliage it, it may have some more potential in the future but again today I'm going to reject this one. And this one was going to be a shot, and I didn't um, include the voiceover. This one in particular was a, a pond just beyond that runoff area, and there was a beautiful crack, but it didn't look safe for me to, to go wandering in, so I rejected that. Now, why is this not doing what I want it to do? This area there. I've been to in the past, but I'm going to um, take a look at what it's turning out today. 
it has a um, significantly higher water level than it had before. And I also see some wonderful horizontal um, rushing waterfall patterns with the streaks of white and some wonderful textures with the bubbles that may be a parallel to the ice or snow on the banks if I can capture that as well. So I'm going to use this as my focus for setup. Once I've decided that the location offers enough of visual interest, I can begin to safely set up my box of glass that I carry with me. Uh, make sure that I include my gloves on every trip, both in summer and in winter. I've had enough mishaps with glass. I select my pieces. I know many of the pieces and their shapes, but I select them based on size, largest to smallest, so that I can frame my composition with the larger sheets and also support the smaller pieces, making sure that whatever I put in comes out in the end. I make my way down to the stream and I place again the larger of the sheets safely at the side and select the one that has the, the um, appropriate chip shape often, chip shape for what I see <laughs> in the waterfall area or in the foliage within the, the site that I've set up. <laughs> stream is pretty fast today and the, uh, the underground Stream bed is pretty treacherous, so I'm extremely careful to put the pieces in securely <coughs> and put them in the mud. Once I've gone ahead and placed my sort of support larger sheets, I can select the smaller pieces that are maybe more vertical, more triangular, and begin to build a composition with the hope that something will end up being usable when the light is right and the water doesn't take it downstream. <laughs> it sits long enough for me to actually move around it and photograph it. There is, a, again, an element of surprise in this that always does shock me when I get the pieces out of the camera, the images out of the camera, and look at what angles have changed what I thought I was seeing. is fairly set and quite stable, especially when it's in a waterfall. I uh, go back up and get my uh, Nikon and bring it down safely so that I can move around the setup and change my point of view, change the angle of light if I have a, a separate light source, which today I don't. Um, but I'm able to move um, with many angles, both high and low, and around the setup. And what I end up with often doesn't look like it's even come from the same composition once I'm through when I've processed these within my Photoshop setup. Here's the final composition that I've compiled and I will end up, I'm hoping to get at least a three to four usable images when I'm done. Once I have enough images, I've exhausted my points of view and the various light reflections, I begin to break the setup down. I'm very careful for all the environmentalists out there. I'm very careful to count how many pieces that I use within each setup, and I re make sure that I return to the box as many as I placed in the river. I've not, to this day, broken any glass and lost it. I'm very happy to say that's, that's the case. Once the shot is finished, I've known how many I've placed in the composition. In this case, there were six. Six went into the river, six came out of the river. Everything is placed back securely in the box. And these are various images that came out of, this was shot over two days, so some are sunnier and some are a little cloudier and more dull. But this was a compilation of untouched images that came out of that same setup. So out of that group, I selected two to talk about tonight so that you can see how they go from a fairly realistic image uh, shot straight into something that I, um, that I prefer and make into my own more painterly composition. 
So on day one, in, on the duller of the two days, I chose this image to start with, which again, some of the surprise that I, some of the enjoyment that I get out of this project is seeing something that I never expect to see when I set up the, um, the shot to begin with. That I cannot remember seeing, but that's pretty much a full screen of what I got. When I look at this, I thought immediately it needs to be a horizontal. It has a, um, it has a sense of landscape, so the first thing I did was I rotated it. I cropped it a bit to make the top glass entirely parallel, closely parallel to the top of the frame. And then I needed to clean up some of the, let me see if I can go backwards. Yeah, no. There was one that was missing. There was much more of a, um, a grassy uh, area in that one that I've deleted. This one needed to be, uh, the contrast needed to be um, reduced so that some of the blacks in the snow, when this got inverted and that inverted step, I seem to be missing here. But once it was rotated, then I inverted it, and then I retouched it. Ah, that was just inverted, this out of order, that's all right. I took the, uh, with curves tool, I took the contrast down in the whites, giving me a lot more um, detail, and I took the detail up in the blacks, so that gave me more to work with. And then finally, it's not as bright here as it is on my screen or as it is when it's printed, but then I did my final color retouching, and that's the image that I came out with, which doesn't, to me, to my eye, have the same sense of more or less flatness as the beginning image did. The second one I chose was this one, and that's what came directly out of the camera. That one I decided to turn vertically. I think I'm responding to the white as if it's, it has an illusion of sky, but I turned it vertically, and then I inverted the color immediately. When I invert in Photoshop, you simply, it's simply the idea that every color that you see on a color wheel, you see opposite, the camera sees, the, the computer sees as the opposite color. That's what the inversion does. And then once you invert, you can do all, use all the same tools that you have in Photoshop. So there I have dulled the contrast to bring out more in the darks. And then I have adjusted the color, and this one needed to be, I thought, rotated back because what was white is now dark and black, and that felt in this one too ominous as if it's, um, it's coming out of a, if, if I have a, a, a parallel to a landscape, it looks too ominous to my eye. So I inverted, I rotated it backwards counterclockwise, and I ended up with more of a landscape feel, and that's the final. It's surprising to me to see the color on these machines as so different from the color on my Mac. And that happens as soon as I change any of the systems I'm working with, including sending it off to the printer. Um, but that's, that's it. That's what I do, and there it is. <laughs> no more, no less. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, Sherry. So It's what you see on the map, but then when you print it or when you send it to the printer, it changes? Can you? Well, um, I don't know this system. This isn't a, a, my Mac. I'm used oh. to my Mac, and my Mac gives me very close to what the printer I use to print the photographs out in the, the lobby printed from. And they have their own tools, but their tools, aside from my choosing to um, strengthen some of the overall color. I see much more closely on my screen what I get than what I do here. Um, but I, I never do a pixel by pixel sort of um, change of color. I do an overall change of color so that whatever, whenever one color adjusts, by default all the others adjust as well. That answer it? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I'm always impressed by the, the light that the edges of the planes of glass and how that, that color comes through so starkly. Do you hand color that or is that part of when you change the color? It just 
it happens globally when I change the color and when I see a color mix overall that isn't pleasing, I, I, my analogy is that the, the tools in Photoshop are almost like a palette of paints. And if I, if I dab one into the, this into that, I can do that globally because the same way that would change all of your paint, whatever you've put that dab into has changed that entire pot so that you've changed. So it's the glass that allows these wonderful edges to yeah. be colored. Exactly. That's great. Any other questions? Yeah, Matt. Can you talk about how you came up with this idea of a process? <laughs> I came up with the idea purely by chance. I was, I was working in a traditional darkroom at the time, and I had all of my framing glass stacked next to one of my cases, bookcases or something that was in there. And when I walked by in the dark, I knocked one of my glass, my sheet glass over, and I had the red light on the safe light, and it illuminated this pile of glass with a red edge. And it, it just fascinated me, so I took the camera out, and then I did a series of, of images inside until someone I was working with said to me, have you ever done this? He was the instructor of a class I was taking. He said, take these outdoors. And I thought, what a foolish idea. Why would I ever do that? Well, all right, I'll try it. I was bored and I said, I'll try that outside. And, and that made all the difference. And that took me up to the, the shoreline in Gloucester and then up in Maine and then um, here in the rivers and the fresh waters. And it just opened up a world of possibilities. It's always because it's, it's, I get something back that I don't expect. And that's what keeps it interesting for me. So you had a connection to water too, then? Mm-hmm. No. Hmm. I, mean, I just want to make sure you just don't get thrown glass away from the book. <laughs> no, I have never lost a piece. I have never broken something and had to sweep it up. I've sliced my hand because glass came out of the box I was carrying, mm -hmm. but I've never actually broken and left glass anywhere. So I've been very careful about that. Any other questions? Yeah. Did you save some of the images that you did originally when you dropped it and photographed it in red light? It sounds such, like such an hellish kind of image with all the sharp edges and the red light. Well, it's funny, that was all when I was doing um, traditional analog photography, it was all black and white. Oh, so it didn't read that way <laughs> at all. And that never, it, it, that I think doing them in color was the result of this teacher of mine saying, take them outside and see what you get taking them outside happened to coincide with my obtaining a digital camera and then not being able to print or wanting to print color in my dark room. So it's just accidents on all sides. Any other questions? I, I think it's, it's fascinating how um, you uh, play with the color and the shading and depth and light but you, you don't, you're not really altering the composition itself, except to maybe make a vertical one, horizontal, and cropping it slightly differently. But you're working with what comes out of the camera, and then pushing the colors. That's something I love to do, I, because framing it for me is critical. But what's more interesting about this project than any other is that no matter what I frame, it doesn't look like what I framed. And unless I have slightly tilted the camera and then I have to adjust for parallel um, edges, I don't, I don't crop them and then blow them up or use them that way. I love the intense color that appears in the lines on the edges of the glass. Mm. Mm. They're really beautiful. Thank you, thank you. And the other, yeah. I never thought about that. I never thought about that, how one influenced the other. I'm sure it did. Maybe um, subconsciously it had something to do with contrast and adjusting, but they're such different processes, so entirely different, even though some of the names are parallel. They're different, but they're similar. They're different, but they're similar. Absolutely. <coughs> Yeah. 
it influences how they compose. And I, I just, you know, I think it's interesting to see how we rotate the crop and the colors. And I'm wondering if that is like some influence for them. I'm sure, I'm sure there is so much of the time that I spent in those darkroom hours and hours and hours printing and printing and fixing and adjusting tone feeds into what I see when I do the adjustments with color at the same time. I have no doubt, but I never made the conscious connection until you asked the question. But now I will, now I will think about it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you mentioned what you were doing with the blacks. That probably came out of the dark room. Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah. 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 Very aware of the dark. I'd love to hear about your connection with bodies of water and maybe the origin of that. What's the origin? Well, the origin was simply the comment. This is uh, that the uh, the photo. It was a um, a community photo a group, not not at all unlike Ava, where I took this course, and the teacher was saying, "Think of this series that you're doing as project work, not as a piece at a time." And so, just keep expanding the project. And I think when I went up to Gloucester first and saw what happened with rocks and sand and low tide. I shot at night with a four by five and I lit with my own, I had multiple flashlights and so I was playing with the light. But coming to Vermont was when I said, oh, look at the ice up here. Some of the ice is, is absolutely fascinating in its texture. And that came out of some of the snow pieces that I did so that ice just became the next fascination and the waterfall that wasn't good the day I did it, that I was showing you in the first video, was two years ago absolutely spectacular because it froze partially as it fell. <laughs> and it gave all sorts of strange globules and, and reflective surfaces that I didn't expect. So I, there's one day when I was at Huntley Meadow without my camera, there was a sheet of ice that had frozen in the most spectacular way I will never forget not having my camera. <laughs> and I can't replace it. But, so it's been a constant quest for that particular ice. Yeah? Could you talk a little bit about your title and how did you come up with the title for this show? And um, the words and oh, yeah. There's something to do with the, the, the feeling that broken glass has is, is uh, there's a lot of treachery in it. You know, treachery for for um, the potential for accidents, but also for violence and the, the break, the aspect of it being so breakable. But when I emerge the pieces in snow or I emerge the pieces in water, it somehow, the substances soften the man-made pieces and that I just kicked around ideas and ideas and ideas and I came up with that. I, I submitted some photographs to the Norwich Historical Society which was partly where that came from, when they had a um, call for images responding to a destroyed Bible about a year and a half ago. And that was such a moving image to see that I thought, okay, well this is where the destruction and regeneration, for me the ice and the water and the glass mm -hmm. somehow made that more of a statement than had I not seen that bit of violence, but it's all more of a um, poetic mishmash when I try to break it down. Yeah? Have you ever considered using extremely old glass? I did actually. A friend, of, a friend of a friend of mine collected, I don't know why he did, but he collected and had in a five gallon bucket some of the really old glass, big, fat, thick, um, bubble filled old glass. And I, those images are long gone. I did black and whites of those. I know I have the, the negatives, but I've never gone back to reprint them. But they turned out all sorts of fun stuff. Yeah. Do you prefer shooting in the winter with, with snow and ice as compared to the summer? Do I prefer to shoot in the winter? snow and ice? Yeah. Um, 
Not necessarily. I, I, I get some of the images I like the best because the ice and the snow and the water create so much more with the glass than I have done quite a few in the woods in the summer, but they, they end up having, the glass ends up always being glass. Even when I invert, there is not the mystery as much of the mystery that I get. One of them out in the lobby that has a, a flowering vine was done without snow and ice. And I, I still like it, but it doesn't, it's more literal than the snow and ice and water with the glass. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you for all those questions. That's really wonderful to hear.